Thank you very much. Um, it's very kind of the speakers to ask me to come and give a lecture here. I don't actually work at King's College. I work at St. Thomas's, which is why you've got this picture. You see St. Thomas's is on the right here. So I want to cover a few areas about managing bleeding. I cannot possibly talk about surgical hemostasis. What I want to talk about is the management of hemostatic problems. I want to tell you about their divergence in international practice, the current evidence base for managing hemostasis, particularly concentrating on fibrinogen and tranosamic acid. Uh, and before we start, I'd like to know about how much that you know, so I'd like to do some voting, please. Can we have the voting slides? So I want to know how, what you think about tranosamic acid. Tranosamic acid reduces bleeding in surgical patients by how much? Would you like to vote, please? Okay, I have some work to do here because it's a third. Next slide, please. So, tranosamic acid is associated with a thrombotic risk. Yes or no? Okay, more work to do. It's not associated with thrombotic risk, as I'm about to show you. Next slide. So, here we go. Practice. Your patient is bleeding out, and a coagulation screen shows a Klaus fibrinogen, functional fibrinogen value of 0.4 grams per liter. Remember, the normal range is 2 to 4. Would you do nothing? Give FFP, give cryoprecipitate, give platelets, or give recombinant 7A? Goodness, okay. So I want to convince you by the end of this talk that you need to give cryoprecipitate. And I think I have one more slide. The risk of hospital-associated venous thrombosis is decreased in those who have major bleeding. True or false? So very good. So it's actually considerably increased um, in those who have had a major bleed. So, moving on. Tranosamic acid. So what is tranosamic acid? It's actually a synthetic amino acid. It's synthetic lysine. It works in a very simple way. If we look at the molecules responsible for clot breakdown, particularly plasminogen, plasminogen binds through lysine binding sites to the fibrin molecule to allow it to start chewing it up. And so if you give tranosamic acid, it will bind to the lysine binding sites, prevent the binding of plasmin to the molecule it's meant to be breaking up, and therefore inhibit its effect. And where we're starting from with tranosamic acid is some very big clinical trials. So back in 2010, we reported on the CRASH-2 study, we, were, we randomized 20,000 patients who were at risk or were bleeding when they came to the trauma department. It was a global study. It took five years to complete. And just to summarize the results in one slide, it showed a 9% reduction in total mortality, but probably crucial to uh, the effect, there was reduction in bleeding deaths by a third. Uh, and this is a very clean effect. 
And the other important thing to note about this very large study is we recorded all the rates of thrombosis. There was no increase in venous thromboembolism. And there appeared to be a signal that there might actually be a decrease in arterial events, uh, particularly in stroke. So as a result of that trial, for the last five years, myself and members of the team have been traveling around trying to persuade everybody to use transamic acid in patients who arrive in trauma departments uh, with bleeding. And if everybody in the world used it, there would be a global reduction in mortality of about 120,000 deaths per year. One of the effects of this study is to change the way we write guidelines about bleeding. So all of the guidelines used to be about looking at massive blood loss. We now talk about looking at major blood loss so that we can make sure that patients who don't have massive bleeding will get transamic acid because we can recommend it in these guidance. So we have reached a very good place in England. We have tranosamic acid in all the paramedic packs, uh, in the air ambulance, and in the trauma departments, if you don't use tranosamic acid in bleeding patients, uh, there's a financial penalty. And this trial has spawned others, so CRASH-3 is um, going on at the moment where we're looking at the use of tranosamic acid in tra traumatic brain injury. That's due to report in two years. We have HALT-IT, which is tranosamic acid versus placebo in those with upper GI hemorrhage, aiming to recruit 8,000. Half of them will be from the UK, and at the moment we're ahead of target as far as recruiting is concerned. And the last, uh, which is one I'm particularly involved in, is the woman study, where we're giving tranosamic acid to 20,000 women with postpartum hemorrhage globally. As you're probably aware, there are probably 100,000 deaths uh, in sub-Saharan Africa every year with postpartum hemorrhage, so a very important study. But you want to know about the use of tranosamic acid in surgery. And since CRASH-2 came out, there has been a wealth randomized controlled studies looking at use in all types of surgery, from ENT to general to cardiac to back to hip to knee. And uh, this systematic review summarized 129 trials conducted up to 2001, which included over 10,000 patients. And you can see with the use of tranosamic acid, there's a reduction of bleeding, and there's also a reduction in mortality. And if we look at those trials and a few more, this is a later study, study from uh, the same group, uh, you can see that there is no increase in myocardial infarction. Indeed, a suggestion that there is a possible minor decrease. So, uh, this same group, which I, I belong to, have produced a further uh, analysis. This is in 2013, looking again at over 100 randomized controlled trials and trying to use a Bayesian approach to work out the effect of tranosamic acid. And it appeared from these studies that tranosamic acid will reduce bleeding by a third if it's used in a prophylactic way, by which I mean you give a gram preoperatively and or a constant infusion. It also gave some signal about the amount you need to give, and there was an, no increased effect of tranosamic acid if you give more than two grams. And for a competitive inhibitor, you would expect to get a plateau effect. Certainly from in vitro studies from the early days, it appears that giving more than two grams would no, give no greater effect. And you can also use it to treat bleeding. So if someone is actively bleeding, you can again give them a gram and it will help reduce bleeding further. 
So the big question remains, what about thrombotic risk? So intuitively, we all think if you're going to make the blood more sticky, you might increase thrombotic risk. Uh, so looking at the data, we have this very big study from the states, which looked retrospectively at 870,000 patients undergoing hip and knee replacement in the states. And those who received tranexamic acid had less transfusion, they had less thromboembolic complications, less acute renal failure, and a very much reduced combined, reduction in combined complication rate. So coming back to dose, if you do, as some of the cardiac anesthetists tried on the basis that's where if you give something, it works well. If I give more, it should work better. It, there is a signal from children's surgery that if you use large doses, and in an adult, a large dose would mean more than four grams, that you would get neurological events. And fitting has been seen. And that's probably because plasminogen and TPA, which are affected by transamic acid, also neurotransmitters. And again, the surgical studies have seen no increased benefit from these larger doses. So the dose appears to be to give a gram either to prevent or to treat bleeding with the option of continuing an infusion through surgery if you're anticipating long surgery. So thrombotic risk seems biologically implausible because this drug is going to limit clot breakdown. It's not actually switching on coagulation. And looking through the clinical evidence, we've got no increased risk in trauma from CRASH-2. We've got the data from PURAN that there's no increased risk in hip and knee replacement. We've got a cardiac surgical trials looking specifically at thrombotic risk. And our, our concern is that actually giving tranexamic acid might actually decrease the rate of arterial events after surgery. And we are, uh, as a group, trying to get funding to give tranexamic acid during surgery, not looking at blood loss, but with the end point of looking at myocardial infarction post-op. The only other area of tranexamic acid is that there is some emerging literature about using it topically. Uh, this comes from hip and knee replacement, where it's sprayed in, in on the surgery towards the end of the procedure. Uh, and this is an RCT that comes from Hartlepool. Uh, they sprayed in one gram of tranexamic acid at the end of total knee replacement. And you can see it reduced blood transfusion, reduced blood loss, reduced length of stay, uh, and cost of episode. So let's get on. So let's presume you've given tranexamic acid at the beginning of the operation, and then the patient develops a bleeding point and starts hosing out, and you have a major bleed on your hands. How would you manage it? What tools do you have? Well, you have two hemostatic tools to use from the blood transfusion service. You have fresh frozen plasma, a fresh frozen plasma is what it says it is. It's a unit of plasma taken off at the time of blood donation and frozen down very quickly. It contains all the missing coagulation factors and inhibitors in normal concentration. Some of the large molecules, factor five and factor eight, will be slightly decreased, but otherwise uh, it's very much as it was when it left the body. Different countries will make FFP in different ways. For example, in the States, they don't freeze the blood down till 24 hours after collection, and so there is a reduction uh, in some of the coagulation factors. And then we need a source of fibrinogen supplementation. In the UK, we use cryoprecipitate. It is what it says it is. The plasma is put at four degrees. All the large molecules come out as a white precipitate and are collected. Cryoprecipitate, very rich in fibrinogen, von Willebrand's factor, factor eight. 
and one bag is usually pooled. Uh, in the UK, we pool five bags, and you need to give 20 bags to increase your fibrinogen by two grams per, per litre. In mainland Europe, they have access to fibrinogen concentrate, so this is fibrinogen collected from thousands of donors uh, and freeze-dried, and it undergoes quite a lot of processing to reduce infection risk. So I'm really concentrating on fibrinogen because if you look at the studies, and this one from Hapala, an extraordinary study, I don't think the UK Ethics Department would allow it, he allowed patients with surgical bleeding to bleed out and only replaced the blood loss with saline. And as the patients bled out, he studied the fall of the various coagulation factors and the platelets, platelets and showed that you only need to bleed out 1.4 blood volumes and you reach critically low fibrinogen levels, whereas you have to bleed out nearly 2.5 blood volumes to hit a platelet count of 50 or to get down to a level of the other coagulation factors which are critically low. Now, why should it be that fibrinogen drops more than anything else? Well, it is that molecule that makes up the clot. So fibrinogen is activated by thrombin to form fibrin. So when you're bleeding out, you're trying to make clot all the time, so you're consuming it at a greater rate than any other factors. And much forgotten by many people, clotting will not work if you have no fibrinogen, because not only is it that final point of the coagulation cascade, it is also the ligand for platelet aggregation. What does that mean? That means platelets bind together through a, a fibrinogen molecule. So no fibrinogen, no functional platelets. So we have a divergence internationally of how we manage your bleeding patient. So we've got data from North America that says our retrospective data from Iraq makes us believe we need to give lots of plasma to our patient because the data from Iraq suggested that those that got FFP were more likely to survive. We're talking about very severely injured trauma patients arriving um, at the center and receiving FFP. Well, of course, these are retrospective studies, so if you're going to die early, you won't have time to get FFP. Nevertheless, these studies have changed practice across the world. So nowadays, if someone is bleeding, the natural response of the transfusion center is to give FFP. In mainland Europe, we have got a very different thing going on. They have access to fibrinogen concentrate and other concentrated uh, factors. And they have started using those in abundance, and they no longer use fresh frozen plasma in the first instance in a bleeding patient. And they would just give fibrinogen and tranosamic acid. So if we remember that evidence has to be graded, we want to see randomized controlled studies to support this data. So we have a box here. It's got all the grade A evidence for using fibrinogen constraints up front when somebody is bleeding out. Oh, OK. So this box contains all the grade A evidence for using fresh frozen plasma up front. Oh, actually, we do have some breaking news. Because we have, in the last few months, had a study published from the States where they did a randomized controlled trial of using fresh frozen plasma up front. And they compared the two ratios that are widely used one to one or one to two, i.e. for every unit of red cells that you give, uh, you give one unit of fresh frozen plasma, or the one to two, you're giving two units of red cells with one unit of FFP. 
This is an amazing enterprise to undertake. They got 12 US trauma centers involved, 200, 680 patients, and they looked at the primary outcome of 30-day mortality. So if somebody arrived in the trauma department bleeding out, they thought that they were going to have massive blood loss, they would get a box. And the box would either have one-to-one, -one, and they gave six units of FFP, six units of platelets, six units of red cell. I should have said one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one because they're putting platelets in the mix too. And then the one-to-two, a box would arrive and they'd have six units of red cells, three units of FFP. And looking at the patient details, typical profile of um, the average trauma patient, fairly young men um, coming in with um, slightly shut down with a tachycardia and the normal sort of ratio of blunt and penetrating injury and nearly 50% requiring massive transfusion. Interestingly, their platelet count on arrival is well within the normal range. And just a quick summary slide, what did they find? They found no difference in 30-day mortality, but uh, what they did point out was that death due to exsanguination was probably improved by giving a bigger proportion of FFP. So how to interpret this data is proved very difficult. I've just come from um, a European group where we have been discussing how we translate this data into guide guidelines. And I think that what we have to say is that if someone is bleeding out, this is going to be the British Society for Hematology guidance for managing bleeding. If someone's got severe bleeding, you think they're heading for massive transfusion, you should be giving red cells and FFP in a greater than one to two ratio. You should also be giving tranexamic acid as soon as you can. And then after that, you should be monitoring with a coagulation screen or uh, with Rotem Teg and adjusting what you give on the basis of your results. So if you've got prolongation of the PT, APTT, so the ratio is more than 1.5, you're going to give fresh frozen plasma in a dose of 15 to 20 mils per kilogram. And importantly, you must be measuring fibrinogen. If it's less than 1.5, which it will be in a really big bleeder, you need to give cryoprecipitate and you give platelets if the platelet count is less than 50, aiming to push it up to over 100. So lastly, just a word on monitoring hemostasis. We're talking about using coagulation screens and platelet counts. You know, I know that the turnaround time for those is probably 60 to 90 minutes and you're way down the line by the time you get that answer back. Uh, and so it's not perfect, and there is a great move to use Rotem and TEG near patient assessment. I don't know what your anaesthetist does at the other end of the table, but it's quite common to see uh, a TEG or a Rotem. Now, we have got some really useful help here from NICE. NICE have looked at the utility of TEG and Rotem in a diagnostic guideline which was published last year. Uh, and they have actually said for the very first time from quite a lot of data now that the TEG and Rotem, if you use them in cardiac surgery, do reduce the use of blood transfusion and critically will reduce mortality, which is an extraordinary thing when you think you're using monitoring. And they are cost effective, so they recommend their use in cardiac surgery. Disappointingly, they also looked in trauma, where there's a lot of data but no RCTs, and postpartum hemorrhage, and said, at the moment, we haven't got enough data. There is no data from normal surgical operations, and it would be very nice to hope that this will come through in the next few years. 
So just to summarize, I think that managing the hemostatic problems of bleeding are an, is an amazing advancing field. Really exciting in the last five to ten years, we're starting to get some really good data to guide us. I have to ask you the question, don't you think tranosamic acid might be the perfect hemostat? Reduces bleeding, reduces mortality by a third. If you use it, it doesn't appear to have any thrombotic risk. So we're heading for a time where we're going to we're going to manipulate hemostasis in the average operation. We're going to give tranosamic acid before the procedure, I suspect, and then at the end of the procedure, you're going to be giving an anticoagulant to reduce the risk of VTE afterwards. If someone does stop bleeding traumatically on you, you need to consider getting red cells and fresh frozen plasma in that patient fairly quickly. And the British Society of Hematology Guidance will be going out soon. Your hematologists will be aware of that, uh, and they will be keen to help. And lastly, don't forget to give thromboprophylaxis to these patients. So I'd like to go back now and ask for the voting slides to see if I might have persuaded you to change your mind on some aspects. So here we go, tranosamic acid reduces bleeding by how much? Okay, so it's a third, <laughs> so we've still got some way to go. Next, next one, please. So tranosamic acid is associated with thrombotic risk. Okay, so it's no. And the next slide. So your patient's bleeding out and you've got a low fibrinogen. What are you going to do? You're still giving FFP. If you give FFP to somebody with a low fibrinogen, it'll actually dilute it down further because the amount of fibrinogen in a unit of FFP is very small and you need to give cryoprecipitate. Next slide, please. So the risk of hospital-associated venous thrombosis is decreased in those who have major bleeding. And it's false. Okay, thank you very much.